What is going on, everybody? Uh, Crypto Ed here with another episode, I guess, of Crypto Happy Hour. Uh, if you're new here, if you're watching us from YouTube, remember to just smash that like button, hit the subscribe button, and take the little bell notification icon. Because we're always all about um, talking about the different um, faces of crypto, different aspects of crypto, and how we can grow our crypto together. And yeah, I'm pretty excited about tonight because we have a lot of people here, a lot of groups here, uh, people of different background. We have uh, like crypto OGs, people who have been around, like people like uh, Mike who has been around. I don't know how uh, how long were you around, but I think of 2013, 2012, even earlier. And then we have uh, Alex, if he's joining us, I mean, later on, uh, he, I think he's been around around the same time too. And then we also have a lot of, uh, uh, you can call these a uh, new bloods, right? Uh, those who've been like, who joined us, um, like who joined crypto like since 2017 and on. Uh, so we have a very diverse group. We have people who are technical, people who are not so technical. We have like farmers, miners, uh, different like, people. And this is how diverse uh, the crypto community is. And I do believe that through our diversi- diversification that the crypto community is strong and that the crypto community can uh, that we can create change and impact in this space. So, so yeah. So this is the schedule we have for tonight. Uh, we have a panel discussion, followed by I guess um after hours hangout, and where we also can talk about crypto news as well too. So, and then uh, before we jump into this, I do want to make it clear. I want to make it as that uh, stressed out that uh, this is gathering of um, crypto enthusiasts. Like we're just sharing ideas. So picture. And that's like a bunch of us having beer and talking crypto, right? None of what we share should be considered and taken as like business or financial advice or solicitation of any security. We're not financial professionals. And and yeah, and um, anything, any tokens we talk about, we should assume that we either have it or we have dumped it in the past or whatever, right? So, so we're not going to sell anything and yeah, with, and with full uh, disclosure, right? Um, yeah. Like we do want to like let you know that um yeah the crypto space is volatile so participate your own risk and if trading is not really your thing um this is what tonight's gathering is about where we want to showcase the different ways people are like growing they're thriving in the crypto space and and it's okay if if every token you touch on binance like goes to shit it's okay because not everybody be a trader not everybody and like is good at like, reading charts and stuff. And this is what we are about. So just before we jump into the panel, I do want to go over a few house rules, right? So the uh, key house rule is, um, I will have a few questions uh, presented and I'll pick two or three panelists to answer. You'll have two to f- one to two minutes to share the answers and you don't have to use up all your time. At the two minute mark, you will get an overtime warning. Um, and if you don't, wrap up i will meet mute you after 15 seconds and also this is probably the most important part right is uh, please be respectful of like the other panelists and the other methods um even if you don't disagree with it uh this is an introductory panel like session for everybody who wants to discover is there more to crypto than just trading so yeah so this is not a debate um, maybe in the future we can do like a debate but tonight this is just a casual talk of a couple crypto folks so yeah, so before, uh, I guess uh, before I get jump into uh, the, the meat of this, right? Um, I do want to introduce um, each one of our crypto panelists here for tonight. And um, the, um, I have to kind of see if um, Alex is here first because he is the first panelist, uh, um, but I don't see him here. So he'll probably be joining us a bit later on. So I'm going to talk, uh, start with our second panelist, uh, which is uh, Mike, and yeah, Mike is one of the OG. So we do want to be respectful of those who have who have been like around for a while, who have been like like key and in, key instrumental in uh, building up uh, the I guess some um, the crypto foundation. So yeah, so a bit about uh, Mike. I'm just gonna quickly pull up his bio. So if you don't know Mike. Uh, Mike is the CEO and founder of CoinCards.com, based out of Vancouver, Canada. Mike has been an advocate and educator in the Bitcoin space since 2013 and has been promoting Bitcoin adoption and usage as well as Bitcoin-based circular economy since 2014. 
So, so Micah, do you want to uh, get, give a, a quick, uh, like maybe a quick uh, intro to your, uh, about yourself and like, maybe like, maybe like a short, like a five minute, like a summary crash course of like what you do and how you are like stacking Satoshi through like providing a service to the crypto community. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, loud okay. and clear. Uh, cool. Yeah. So uh, my name is Mike Boltoff. I'm the founder and CEO of CoinCards.com. Um, and so we started back in 2013, 2014. Um, and our main goal was to get crypto to be used by people and to get be accepted at businesses. And, you know, anybody who was around Vancouver in 2013, there was a big push to try and get businesses to accept crypto. Um, I think Adam and Freddie and Andrew Wagner were doing a bunch of work with trying to get people to accept crypto, but it was a lot of mom and pop shops. And, you know, we knew we were years and years away from any big companies actually ever taking crypto. Um, so what I did is I started a little company that kind of made them take crypto and they didn't know about it. So um, that's kind of how we started. We, uh, we just, we sold gift cards um, for large corporations like Amazon, Walmart, Tim Hortons, things like that. And when people sent us crypto, we would buy the cards and, you know, we would just kind of hustle that way. And it grew into uh, what it is today. And we're in Canada and the US. Um, we have working partnerships with most of the brands that we work with now. Um, so the retailers actually know a bit about crypto. Um, they don't want to touch it yet, but they're okay with us touching it. So. For the meantime, that's okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, I just, I'm a big believer in the circular economy. I think Bitcoin should be used as a currency, whether that's on, you know, layer one or layer two, um, you know, or shit coins. <laughs> um, if you want to spend altcoins, go for it. Um, I just, I think that to get where we need to go, Bitcoin has to be used in everyday trade and it needs to be feasible to be used in everyday trade. And yeah, I, I want to get away from corporations that like MasterCard and Visa and all those banks that track all our transformation or transactions and want to direct our daily lives based on our spending. Pretty, yeah, that's pretty cool what you are doing. So, so now I'm going to invite our next uh, analyst, uh, which is... Oh, I, I think you went on mute. Did I mute myself? Yes. <laughs> I think so, yeah, did, now, yeah. Yeah. So, so now let's have our uh, next panelist, which is uh, Christopher Wong. Uh, he's a YouTuber. He's a, a crypto enthusiast, but also he is known for uh, his DeFi yield farming adventure within uh, the crypt the DeFi space. So, um, so Christopher, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about um, your, how long? Yeah, you've for been sure. Farming for adventure. For sure. I'm I'm Chris. Uh, Chris Wong from uh, Vancouver as well. So I'm in the same city, Mike. So that's cool to see someone else from uh, Vancouver. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've, I haven't been in the crypto space, honestly, that long. Like I've only been in the crypto space since uh, November of last year. Right. Um, I, I can't remember exactly which shop it was in Vancouver, but there's like a coffee shop somewhere like towards downtown that has like a Bitcoin machine. And I actually saw the first Bitcoin machine. Like, I can't I think this was like, maybe like i want to say like somewhere in 2016 2017 if i had to guess and uh that, that's oh waves that's that's the one thank you that's that is exactly the one <laughs> um that's that's good to know because i want to go back there because that was the first time i ever saw bitcoin and i think at that time it was like a couple thousand dollars if i if i recall correctly and i didn't buy any and i really wish i did <laughs> but obviously you know just seeing a random machine that just says bitcoin on it and i've never seen anything about it i just thought it was a scam right um, so that's really cool, but yeah, I, I've been doing some YouTube stuff. I haven't been putting out any content recently. I need to get back on that train. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm invested in many projects, um, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum amongst other projects, but it's really cool to see like DeFi and NFTs and all these other like use cases. And, um, you're seeing like a lot of institutional adoption and a lot of bullish news recently. So that's really good to see in addition to like, you know, uh, like El Salvador news and news like that. So you can just really kind of see like all the media attention coming through. And um, I'm really excited to be in this space. Um, 
I'm like interested in looking at like cryptocurrency jobs and whatnot. So um, I'd love to work like, for example, I, I applied to Dapper Lot Labs here in Vancouver. I don't know if you guys know about like Flo, the Flow blockchain, but uh, they have they have a bunch of jobs open, and I did a couple applications to that place because I would love to get closer to a blockchain and just like kind of interact with that and get my hands on that. But uh, yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, it's good to meet you all. So look forward to discussing with you guys and girls. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. And then uh, next up, uh, we have our next panelist, which is uh, Chris Colicott from Avison, I guess, uh, photography or avison.ca. And so a bit about Chris, uh, Chris Colicott is an award-winning master panoramic landscape photographer based in Vancouver, British Columbia. Seems like <coughs> all of us are from Vancouver tonight. Yeah, so, yeah, so he specializes in ultra high resolution images of cityscapes and wilderness landscape. Chris is an expert um, in um, the fast technique, stitching together hundreds of high resolution photographs to form a single image uh, that contains incredible views of depth and beauty. Over the past five years, Chris's work has earned him more than 50 international awards, including the prestigious Master in Fine Arts credential from the Master Photographer International. Chris's fine prints are featured prominently in private collections, homes, offices, and all over the world. In addition to the fine prints, his photography has been used for large scale applications in airports and on buses, magazines covered, and other corporate installations. Some of his clients include Mercedes Benz, Vancouver Tourism, BC Hydro, and Destination BC. Chris has also participated as a judge for the renowned um, Epson International Panoramic Awards and regularly teaches advanced photography workshops around the world. So, and Chris is going to be talking about how he is taking his photography expertise and moving them onto the NFT space. So do you want to tell us a bit about what you're doing in this space? Yeah, thank you so much for having me on this panel today. I appreciate uh, being here to be able to speak with you about um, such amazing developments in uh, blockchain technology and all the crypto space that comes around that. As Ed mentioned that, you know, I've been in the space of selling art uh, for many years now, over a decade. And obviously it starts with the physical prints uh, to you know canvas, paper, aluminum, and then the digital art where I'm selling now large scale images uh, for wall murals for commercial purposes. And then I guess it was about three months ago, I started seeing some of my photography colleagues selling NFTs and they were selling it for a lot of money. So right now it seems that it's the, um, ETH is the, the, the platform or currency they use to create the smart contracts um, for creating these NFTs on different marketplaces. And when I started to look into it, I saw that people were selling basically JPEGs for over $100,000. And then images like mine that I, that I produce for anywhere from 10 to $100,000. And obviously that got my interest. I started to look a little bit more into the crypto space and I quickly realized that the blockchain and that technology is going to be the future. There, there is going to be one day where I can go online, click and buy a car and all the paperwork with the lawyers, the banks, uh, everything in between is going to be re replaced by the blockchain because we're now able to transfer ownership from one person to other, another person without all the in between. And that is the same thing with the NFT. So I am creating an image that is the original version that is only gonna be able to be collected by one person. Now I could make it you know, um, a series out of a hundred or a one out of one, but um, regardless, the fact is there are some collectors or whales out there that are spending $100,000, $200,000 per week on NFTs. And this really got my attention because I, I didn't really understand the crypto space before this. So I'm literally two or three months into it. Uh, but I realized this is the future. And it's an unusual market because I'm in sales full time uh, uh, outside of, you know, 
photography and all that. And I always say, hey, look at me, check my workout. Would you like to buy it? But you can't do that in the NFT space um, when it comes to collectors. They need to see you through um, just seeing your post from the outside. Otherwise they call it shilling. So there's some <laughs> really strange, so I know exactly who the collectors are, who would actually buy my work. Um, uh, I know two of them right now that spend hundred, two hundred thousand $200,000 US per week on images just like mine. So it, it, it's a little bit of a slow process because everything happens on Twitter. Uh, but the fact is, whoever these whales are, they have a big pockets. There's a lot of money to be made. And I'm excited about when I do sell them, how am I gonna invest that crypto into something else? Um, how am I gonna take that? Am I gonna spread it out into Bitcoin, ETH, some of the altcoins? And where are we at right now? Because I guess I've just joined after a huge drop in a lot of the um, cryptocurrencies. And that is a great opportunity, I believe, in, in my space right now. So that is, yeah, so I'm brand new. I'm a noob at this whole thing. But at the same time, I'm, I'm really paying attention to all of this. And I truly believe there is such a future in, in not just NFTs, but the blockchain and all the crypto technologies uh, in the future. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, that is very exciting. Um, and wow, like, it seems like you really have done your homework. You know like how, like who the big whales are, how much people are making the space. And and yeah, and, I've, and I do feel that I'm like, for a lot of these projects, like, like we had to start somewhere, but eventually um, when you've been around long enough, when you have provided, when you will produce enough uh, value for like uh, you will start rising up. So I'm going to start uh, the questions we have here. So let's start. Um, so let's, so let's start with, uh, so I'm going to pull up uh, this, the projector, uh, projector. <laughs> let's share my screen again. So I do have some questions here that I prepare. And for the audience here, if you have questions, uh, feel free to type in the comments and I'll note them and add them over. So um, the first question for all, each one of you is, I want to know um, how hard is it to get started like, in each of the spaces? So maybe you just start with, uh, for, with, start with Mike first. Yeah, so I mean, with me, I pretty much built our website version one within a weekend. Um, at the time, the only payment processor was BitPay. Um, so I kind of tapped into BitPay for version one. Um, and they basically handled all of the crypto payments that we needed to do and sent us um, a portion in fiat and a portion in um, in crypto. Um, so it was pretty easy. Um, I'd stay away from BitPay now. <laughs> I don't like them at all. I'd probably go with like a BTC pay or an open note or somebody like that. Um, but it's it's pretty easy. Um, if you can build a website, I think you can get um, get started getting paid in crypto um, for your goods. I mean, even contractors, if they've got a wallet on their phone, they can start making crypto. It's pretty easy. I think you're still muted, Ed. Ah, yeah, always keep muting, muting myself. So, yeah, so um, so as so, I t uh, tell us some how long have you been? Like, I guess some how long has Coin Cards been around, and how many, like, how many orders have you like served so far? Yeah, um, we've done a lot. I'm not gonna say because it's yeah. it's still it's kind of a industry secret of how much orders we do and. I don't want to be targeted by any of the three letter agencies. So yeah. uh, <laughs> we're going to keep that one quiet, but uh, we've been going since 2013. Yeah. Um, we grow a lot year over year. Um, yeah. I'd say we're obviously, I think we're the biggest in Canada for what we do. Um, yeah, that, that's where that ends. <laughs> uh, and then um, next up, uh, let's have uh, Christopher talk about. Yeah, so how hard is it? to get started with uh, DeFi you for me? 
Honestly, it's it's not that it's not that hard, uh, and especially when you have like platforms or networks such as like Matic, and you know BSC, and and I'm not personally on BSC, but there's there's so many other uh, other than just Ethereum, um, and I'm doing some on Ethereum as well. Like it's it's honestly not that hard to get started. Um, I would say that like if you have a a smaller investment portfolio, like a uh, like a small amount to invest in, you're probably gonna want to be on to- on the networks that have very low transaction fees, such as like Phantom and Matic and BSC, right? Like, cause Ethereum can, can tend to have a little more higher gas fees. So if you have a small investment, it's not gonna be worth for you to keep constantly transacting um, when you don't have a large like portfolio amount to put into DeFi. But I mean, a lot of the APYs are very sustainable. You obviously have to do your own research and you know, anything could technically happen. like a hack could technically happen at any point on, on a lot of these projects too. It's not just because they're bad projects, but um, there's always the possibility for like exploits and whatnot, but um, it's a very lucrative way to learn, to earn tokens and yield um, even during through a bear market or, or a bull market, right? There's, it doesn't really matter in that risk in that sense. Um, as long as there's people that are swapping um, you can still make money at being a liquidity provider and just straight up staking as well. Um, so I, I would recommend like Matic um, personally. I, I've used that every day, but I do about 10 or so transactions every day on the Matic network. So definitely uh, something I would use for it to get started. You're on mute. Okay, sounds good. I think I left. yeah, that was feedback. Uh, <laughs> Well, from Echo, but yeah, so let's uh, move on to the next uh, panelist, uh, which is Chris. Uh, since uh, Chris uh, is like starting out in the NFT space, uh, maybe can you tell us a bit about uh, how hard it was for you to learn about the space and maybe your process of how you, how you, like, you like, learn and how long it took for you to learn? Yeah, so um, basically, the day I learned that my fellow uh, photographers were making so much money. I said, "Okay, how do I how do I make an NFT? How do I even start this?" So the first thing I realized is that everything was transacted in ETH, um, Ethereum. So the first thing I did is, "Okay, how do I buy Ethereum?" Um, so I just Googled it, and the first place I signed up for was um, uh, Netcoins and then Coinbase, and it was a really easy process. Took about twenty minutes. Uh, you basically have to sign up. You have to submit your 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 ID and make a couple of videos where you prove that who you are. You know, uh, just who you say you are is who you are. And once you get an account like that, I could easily e-transfer um, money from my bank account and then buy uh, the any kind of coin that I want, depending on the platform. So. Uh, Netcoins, of course, I, I discovered has, is really limited in, in what you can purchase. Um, but regardless, it didn't take me long to buy um, ETH. And once I learned how to buy ETH, I knew how to transfer it to the marketplace where they mint and then um, show the NFTs. So there's something called gas fees. Um, anytime you create an NFT using the Ethereum um, uh, crypto, uh, it, it, it requires calculations. It requires, quote, gas money, I suppose, because it uses fossil fuels, a lot of energy uh, to do those calculations. And oddly enough, there's a website that tells you what the gas fee is at any current time, and it can fluctuate anywhere from $10 US up to $40 US throughout the day. So I wait until the time it's about 10 bucks a little bit cheaper. I mint it. It creates the NFT. It's now on the blockchain. It's now encrypted to be uh, unique and different. And then I pay the curator fee or to have it put onto the marketplace. Uh, Obviously, that's the fee that the marketplace wants to collect. And if I do sell it, they do also take a a foundation is the one I'm using, take a 15% cut um, out of any transaction. But overall, you know, based on the amounts of that I've seen NFTs sell for, that's that's a small amount. I've seen these gifts that look absolutely ridiculous, like hopping bunnies, sell for two hundred thousand dollars. 
um, you know, it looks like a cartoon or something, um, which is crazy, but that's the reality. So uh, I guess, yeah, it took me one day to figure out how to buy crypto and then get an invite. So maybe three days by the time I minted my first NFT. Wow, that's pretty, yeah, that's uh, pretty fast. Uh, how you went from um, someone who's very new and how you got started. And okay, so uh, the next uh, question I have uh, for everyone, all uh, this uh, is it's uh, more uh, for everyone who's curious about like the different methods. I'm like, how much on um, uh, can an average person make uh, using your method? So. I know uh, for my guy, he has trade secrets, but uh, maybe you can talk about like uh, maybe running about providing like a crypto service uh, in general. Right? How much like can this someone go, like full time doing this, or this would this be more uh, suitable for like a, a side hustle type of thing? Um, yeah, I mean this this is a pretty good question. I mean this kind of depends on what you're doing, right? Like, so say you're an electrician who takes crypto, you're not going to get paid in crypto very often. But you might get like one or two guys a month that are like, yeah, I'll pay you in crypto. That's cool. Um, so then, you know, it's just you're making your hourly rate in crypto um, if you charge it that way. If you're a store and you want to accept crypto, you know, obviously stores have costs. So you're going to have to convert your costs, but then you can make all of your profit or as much of your profit as you want in crypto. Um, depending on how many people want to pay for your product in crypto. You know, if you have something that is not very popular amongst the crypto community, you might make one sale a month. If you have something that, if you're selling Bitcoin nodes, you're probably going to get 50% of your transactions or more in crypto. Um, so, I mean, it's obviously it's a bit of a marketing ploy too for you. You got to kind of figure out who your, your target audience is. But, I mean, you can make as much as you can push through in volume, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it, it could vary. I mean, like, uh, I think I heard on uh, some some of the discussions about when Tesla uh, first accepted uh, Bitcoin for Tesla cars. They didn't really make, they didn't really sell that many Tesla cars. That's why they canceled it, right? But but they but uh, they wanted to like do the whole environmental spin. Uh, there's a whole conspiracy uh, behind it. I'm not going to go dig into it, but uh, something. <laughs> I heard it was one. <laughs> I heard they sold oh, one car for Bitcoin. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but I mean, like, it really comes out to like uh, whether people, like, whether it makes sense for people to spend, right? Because um, back when Tesla first came out, people, a lot of crypto hodlers were like, it made no sense for them to trade in their appreciating asset for a depreciating car. <laughs> so that's why they didn't really make a lot of sales. Uh, but yeah, it come, really comes down to like, your field and such and i could imagine the same for uh back in 2017 uh when kfc when they first uh they did like a marketing gimmick right where they were accepting uh bitcoin for uh, a bucket of kfc and that disappeared like after like after two months i think i'm um, after the bitcoin tank in 2018 they said oh we're done so yeah it really comes down to like interest and whether people are willing to spend or not and then uh, so maybe next, uh, next panel, uh, maybe for, I mean, for Chris, uh, would you care to tell us uh, how much do you think an average person can make uh, through uh, you farming? Um, you're not plugged in. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Um, so it kind of depends because a lot of the the APYs for the for the staking and for like liquidity pro providing on DeFi is very variant, right? You could get literally have something that's like 0.1 percent all the way to like 50,000 percent. And I mean, those APYs that are really high are likely not sustainable, as you can see uh, when Titan collapsed. <laughs> um, so you kind of have to do your research there, but. Personally, I think I'm, I think I'm like averaging like around, I don't know, like 800, 900 a month, like on my portfolio, like just, just straight up passive income. Um, uh, you know, some of those are, are vested, so they are locked, but I mean, I'm still making those, those tokens. Right. So it, it's, it's possible for you to make a large amount of money, um, even with small amounts of, of, um, crypto. So it kind of just depends on what your, what your risk is and what, type of like investment 
uh, investor you are. Um, if you don't mind I, me asking, um, how much of a capital uh, were you working with? Like initially, uh, well, so um, initially I started like with like five hundred dollars in Bitcoin and in Ethereum, and then I kind of went down to all my other um, like shit coins, as some people will say, or altcoins. <laughs> um, but I mean, right now I'm probably sitting around like thirty, thirty-seven ish. Um, that's Canadian dollars. Um, I mean, not everything is deployed in DeFi, but basically everything I have is either staked or it's in an LP pool um, somewhere. It's most of my stuff is either straight up staked. Um, but because it, it just makes no sense to just hold an asset uh, when you could just be like um, producing like yield with your asset. So I just I just tend to put it somewhere and make sure it's it's earning some money. Um, so that's what I'm doing with mine. That's cool. And then uh, I guess uh, for Chris, uh, uh, Chris Collicott, uh, I think you mentioned a bit earlier how you noticed some people were making like 50K, 100K a month, uh, well, it's a, a week or something. <laughs> right, so, um, but um, how, how about, what do you think I'm an average person um, who's starting out? How much do you think they could make? Yeah, so it, it's really difficult to tell right now because it, to me at least, it's very, very new. Um, this is a new trend that is just emerging and I noticed the trends through my photography contact because everyone is trying to jump on right now. Um, so really, I personally, I believe now is the time to get into selling NFTs before it gets super saturated. Uh, the one thing I noticed is uh, most of the collectors use Twitter as a platform for communicating. So that seems to be where you need to be uh, building up your network, unfortunately. That is the one platform that I did not use for the last 10 years. I, I, I used Instagram and so I have 35,000 followers on that. I've got over 70,000 followers on Facebook, but then I just didn't use Twitter because it wasn't really uh, photographically, you know, it's not presenting photographs that easily. Uh, so I have a little bit of catch up to do, but if you play it right, I mean, this one girl that I know she just started, um, I guess, about a month and a half ago, and she's probably sold about one hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of NFTs to this point. And now that she's got some momentum, every new release she does, uh, it's noticed. So more collectors can see what's happening. Uh, there are other ways that you can really push your NFTs is by creating a lot of asset marketing. So instead of just posting it, uh, she spent obviously some money to create this great video introduction saying, hey, on this date, on this date, on this date in the future, I'm going to be dropping these NFTs. She created this really cool video about what she does and how she captures them, the story behind it. Um, so there's a whole marketing aspect behind it just to create that interest for the, the, the collectors. So I think that's also, you know, something, it's almost like you have to advertise yourself create a commercial. Uh, so those people who do that are much more successful in getting attention of the collectors because the collectors seem to be just sitting on there, you know, poking around and whatever pops up and they, hey, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and just spend five or 10 ETH on that, on that particular EFT and, or an NFT. And that's, that seems how to go. So now is the time to get into it if, if, if there's any time. You're on mute. Still on mute. And <laughs> I always end up muting myself, but but yeah, but um, what? Uh, no, yeah, I just want to um show some of uh, the pictures uh, from Chris's, uh, I guess some um, Chris's website, um, I guess foundation, right? And so uh, where was this picture taken? Look like looks like it's like under a wall. Wow, this is like a motion. Yeah, so this one is taken under Helmkin Falls in in British Columbia. Uh, it's a very difficult place to get. So in order for me to get there, I actually had to. Um, spend half a day uh, 
going down a 30 foot wall of ice, uh, ropes, ice axe, uh, you know, the full ice climbing gear, and then and then travel a, a couple over crevasses. And then of course, when you get down there, you have to make sure you're not standing under some of those icicles, which are the size of school buses, because if they fall on you, you're not gonna survive. Um, so yeah, so, you know, some of my images that I take, and you can see that I've added some animation to it. So it looks like yeah, it's can, going. Yes, uh, did you do um, the animation yourself or did you, uh, were you working with like a, like a video videographer? No, there, <laughs> there's some really easy to use online tools that just, you know, it's point and click and you can add some animation to it. And that just creates that little bit of extra effect. Uh, the other interesting thing that, that is beneficial um, when selling NFTs, I find is if a collector buys an NFT, I will send them a uh, physical print as well. Um, oh. So this, this physical print will be pretty big. So maybe 50 inches by 40 inches on aluminum. It might cost me $800 to produce and send, but based on if I sell for a five ETH, then it, it's nothing, right? So um, mm -hmm. that is something else that a lot of photographers are now doing. Most of them send really small images. So my, my, my differentiation now is I sell a really large image because based on what the kind of work I do is all about um, large photography. Now you can see now these images below which are not landscape photography. Uh, they kind of look like organisms. Yeah. If oh, you go back. One, uh, oh, if we go back here, I was the one. Yeah, so if you go to the bottom, you'll see these weird looking cell-like um, images. Oddly enough, yeah. those are real photographs, but they're of feral fluid in a Petri dish mixed with um, oh, wow. glow stick fluid or white acrylic paint with a, with a powerful magnet underneath it. And then, so everything you see here is about one inch across. Uh, and then, wow. re, and it's just a photograph that I took and then I animated it. So coming up with something unique and different that no one's ever seen before is also something that seems uh, collectors like to see. Yeah, I mean, Chris, like, can I ask you a question about that? Um, are you? Yeah, Sorry, right. I just wanted to ask if are you building any sort of like utility or um, uh, with your NFTs? Um, I'm just interested. I, I, I personally have one NFT. I actually have a couple, four NFTs, but um, I always like to see some sort of utility behind NFT. So I was just wondering if like by chance you're you're building anything behind your like NFTs. So what, for example, what type of utility are you are you doing? Yeah, I mean, like, for example, um, one of the projects I'm in, um, like, you can literally spend the stones that you can farm with the tokens to, for example, go to the World Cup or, um, like, buy a cool NFT, which then gets you access to someone's, um, like, a one-on-one -on -one with them. So th that sort of utility is what I was right, referring right. to. Not every yeah. NFT has them, but I was just wondering if you actually have any behind your um, uh, Not yet. Your I mean, so far, what I offer is a physical print. Um, but I, you know, I have to get a full-time job because of COVID, but I have seen other photographers offer workshops. So they will let you come on a workshop in Canada to visit the Rockies for a full week. Everything is covered. You go and see all the beautiful places in the Rockies, um, become and be part of one of the photography tours, even if you don't know anything about photography. So I've seen that type of utility uh, and recently, um, one of my fellow photographers, she started at um, three ETH and I think it ended up selling for, it, it's still on bid, right? It was a bidding war. So now it's on for about eight and a half ETH. To wow, that's a lot. <laughs> wow. Right? So yeah, people are like, wow, I'm, I get, and okay, she's, she's a very beautiful young lady too. So I'm sure there's something involved with that. But um, yeah, so these people are like, wow, I get to travel with this lady and um see those beautiful places okay so uh so next question i have is uh <coughs> just to on uh, for each of these um so what are some of the challenges you may have faced uh, with uh, what with the, with, uh, the work you're doing um, so maybe with, uh we can start with mike um, i could imagine for micah when <coughs> when back when you first started and i don't know does it apply now but um what what are you doing you're working with like both 
fiat and crypto, right? So I'll, I'm guessing like somewhere in between you have to work with a bank. So just curious, um, you work with banks and did they, if yes, uh, did they give you a hard time and how do you get around them? Uh, yeah, so banking is a strange one. We're kind of, because we're a merchant, we're not um, technically a crypto exchange. So we kind of fall in that nobody really cares kind of gray area. Um, but banking, trend, if I was to open a new bank account, I don't think I'd get one. I think I kind of just got grandfathered into one. <laughs> oh. um, and then uh, another big challenge was actually just working with the vendors. Um, so we have a pretty good relationship with most of the vendors now, but there are some vendors that have been like, you're doing what with our gift cards? No, 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 don't, don't do that. We, we don't like crypto. Crypto is illegal. <laughs> like, you hear the craziest things and, you know, lawyers get involved and, you know, there's been certain companies that have just completely cut us off, stolen thousands of dollars worth of gift cards from us and just, you know, so it's it's an everyday struggle trying to get those vendors on board. Um, we're in a pretty good position now, um, but that was one of our struggles was basically just trying to convince the world that crypto was okay and it's not a scam and it's not for drugs. Um, yeah. So that was something during the early days or like, or do you that, see that still happens now? Still like happens. there's still people who wow. think that, you know, oh, crypto don't drug users use that. And it's like, well, no, that's the U S dollar you're thinking of. Like, <laughs> yeah. It makes no sense. Like if you, if you have a public ledger blockchain that you can literally track every transaction, but we're saying that this is this is what's being used by criminals. And you look at like, just think about it. If you ever want to do a drug deal, what are you going to do? You're not going to use your credit card. You're not going to use an e-transfer. You're just going to give someone cash because there's no way to track it. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it makes no sense. It makes zero sense. Yeah. Like, like everything, in, everything in crypto is on the blockchain. It's like transparent. So that's like, that's like the worst way for criminals to move money around. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, at the end of the day, to, to get it out, you have to go through an exchange. And then as soon as you hit the exchange, you know, you're, yeah. you're linking Talks everything. So, yeah, I mean, that's how uh, the hackers behind uh, the colonial uh, oil pipeline like, yeah. got caught. I mean, like, they should have asked for like, money in like a briefcase, like Fiat briefcase or Monero. <laughs> but... <laughs> But Monero is a lot harder for people to get started with. So <laughs> the best choice is really just leave a briefcase behind a dumpster. <laughs> but yeah, but I'm, I'm just going to quickly uh, show, uh, like, I uh, just show, show your site. So like, so yeah, it looks like uh, you have a lot of, uh, you have Visa on board, you have a lot of services on board. And yeah, I think that looks like pretty cool with what you guys are doing. How, yeah. And um, yeah, I'm glad that um, you have, that you're growing, that getting you helping um, people in the crypto space uh, like transition into like I guess take, like enjoy the crypto earnings instead of thinking oh I can't do anything with it. like Bitcoin. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and then uh, maybe next uh, I can ask uh, uh, Christopher Wong um, with uh, DeFi U farming. What are some of the challenges that uh, face? Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, I'll tell you a funny story. And uh, no, I have I've never actually been rug pulled or uh, exit scammed. So, the, I mean, having said that, that is one of the probably one of the largest challenges you'll face um, in DeFi. So again, when you when you put, for example, let's just say a thousand dollars into the Matic ecosystem, for example, um, there's always a chance that someone could find an exploit and then drain the funds from the Matic ecosystem. That's entirely possible. Anyone who says it, that's not possible is, is lying to you. Um, every um, protocol has its own risk um, because it's actually, it's code, right? Um, you can hack code. Um, and there's also like exit scams and rug pulls where people will just dump all their tokens on you and just sell. And then you just get caught holding the bag with zero. Um, one funny story I'll tell you, and this is kind of just related to the whole crypto space is, um, there's no refunds or receipts. So what I did is I had a small bag of polka starter and I sent it to the wrong address. So mm. some random dude probably got like my 250 polka starter, um, tokens. So whoever got those, good luck. <laughs> you can take, you can keep it. <laughs> so, um, definitely something that, uh, you know, you, you can definitely make some mistakes there. But uh, I mean, overall, DeFi is is pretty good. Um, 
again, there are challenges for, for those sort of protocol risks and, and, and vulnerabilities, I'd say is probably the biggest thing um, in DeFi that's an issue. Yeah, platform risks. Is, uh, yeah. And then also, I guess, some human errors. <laughs> yeah, definitely some some human error on uh, on my part. <laughs> I took responsibility for that. Yeah. And I mean, and yeah, I mean, but but for those uh, small risks that you face, you also, yeah, you also uh, give yourself an opportunity to make like a massive gain. So that's the exciting thing about uh, DeFi and new farming space. So, and then, um, and then I guess uh, for next, uh, next panelist, uh, Chris Kalkov, uh, you want to, sh I, I know you share a bit about uh, uh, getting started, it could be hard at getting attention. Do you, want, do you want to elaborate a bit more of, of that? Or like, do you have any plans on how you want to like get the attentions of uh, the whales or any partnership you want to work with? Yeah, so I mean, I guess I've been, I've been sort of waiting for, since May. So it's been, you know, Time is ticking on. I, I just see all these people that are selling their NFTs, and a lot of them are people that are, I guess, first time photographers. So I, I'm thinking about slowly asking questions. So maybe tagging them, the collectors, and say, hey, you know, when you buy an NFT, what size of print do you prefer? Is there, is it, is there too big of a size? Uh, you know, or, or do you want a choice? So it's a way of getting their attention without saying, hey, look at my stuff, but asking their opinion about, um, because they're getting these, they're getting these physical prints from a lot of, from a lot of the NFTs now. So I can just imagine their house is starting to fill up. Um, so do they really want a huge size or maybe they do? Maybe they have a mansion, I don't know. But it's, it's a way of asking their opinion about their expertise um, without actually saying, hey, look at my stuff. And I'm just hoping that they'll just look at my link, my, my Twitter, and of course, what I have pinned is are my NFTs at the top. That's the first thing they look at, which then they can kind of see my work. So I think that's gonna be my next strategy um, in terms of the uh, NFT. So I just don't wanna shoot myself in the foot. So I'm kind of cautiously watching how other artists get attention of the collectors. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm probably going to make a little bit more of an aggressive move soon because uh, yeah, I, I see people that just join and then within a couple of weeks, they've just made $50,000. Yeah. Uh, so. I would probably say that's more of like a, a rare, a rarer occurrence, Chris, yeah. like not, not every, just so everyone's aware, not every artist is going to like make $50,000, right? Um, oh no. Yeah. Very so few do. Just to be very clear about few that. Do. Yeah. But yeah, some of those NFTs go for crazy amounts. Like, I don't know if anyone's been watching like OpenSea. Um, you know how like all the, everything crashed, right? Um, there's this um, there's this NFT called uh, the Boring Ape Yacht Club and they look really cool. And these things are selling for like 20 ETH a piece at least. So um, those are some really cool NFTs if you ever want to take a look at those. They're pretty expensive, but I mean, that's an example of something that's really popular. Like Crypto, crypto Punks is also pretty popular. These are probably the two most popular ones at the moment, I'd and say. Hop and animated hopping cats. I have not seen that one yet. <laughs> I'll post it. It sold for 185,000 for 80, 85 ETH. Yeah, I remember um, the most notable NFT um, that I wish I got in on, but um, I was, but um, crypto wasn't doing that well back then, right? So I couldn't get in on it. But um, I, I, uh, this was uh, with... Uh, Back uh, in September, when this uh, I guess crypto association in Hong Kong, uh, they they bought this uh, I guess they bought this some uh, advertising space on this uh, these trolley trams, right? And they had this um, NFT where if you buy the NFT, you can redeem like a model, like a small model you can put it on the desk of a tram like, with the Bitcoin logo on it. So, so I think uh, they sold that they sold out on that like, really quickly. I think I think they were selling for like two E for something, but uh, but yeah, I think that was a pretty notable thing. Uh, they got a lot of press coverage. People, everybody, at least everybody who's excited about seeing like uh, crypto being shown on my banners are excited. And I think it was one of the first times I were not the first time. The first time was when Roger Veer bought an ad that says buy Bitcoin, but probably one of the 
the like more recent times where people were just excited to see that hey people are spending money buying up ads to like highlight crypto so that was pretty cool uh but yeah and i could picture that uh, you may yeah a lot of times you have to stand out like um i think what's his name uh purple cow guy yeah um because ted talk guy uh seth golden there you go seth golden he did a ted talk on um like doing something that stands out, something remarkable, right? That's how you get attention. And maybe that's what you may have to do, uh, Chris, uh, if you want people to like notice your NFTs, you have to like pull up some kind of neat publicity stunt to get their attention. But Okay, so um, so this is, um, and I'm just gonna start looking at, at the audience question to see if, if I miss any questions from the audience. Okay, so this is one question uh, for uh, uh, Chris Calicott, uh, which is um, how much ETH uh, did you spend uh, minting an NFT? Yeah, so there's there's two what they call gas fees. Um, so there's a fee to create the or mint an NFT, and it ranges from ten dollars US to about fifty, uh, depending on the time of day. There are some websites that will actually tell you the amount it's going to cost before you do it. Uh, and usually it's, you know, late at night or something like that, I guess, when less people are trying to mint. Uh, so, yeah, it could cost $10 to mint and it could cost $10 to then have it curated or posted onto the marketplace. So you're looking at $20 US up to $100 US on average. And where are you minting those by chance, Chris? Uh, are you doing it on Immutable or which no, which platform are you doing it on? They are they are all done directly on the platform that you sign up for. So if, if I do it in Foundation, they do the minting on on their platform. If it's super rare, you do the minting on their platform. So they have their own system to do it, and there are websites that will tell you for each platform what the current minting fee is for that platform. Mm. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've I've heard like I've heard a couple are pretty good, like immutable and um, decentraland and all those sorts of NFT stuff. That's that's where I hear most people are kind of putting out um, NFTs. But I haven't minted one myself, so I don't know. Yeah, and then it depends on what kind of art you sell. So there are certain platforms that are better for certain genres of art. So in Foundation, um, there's a lot of animated stuff, but that's where I found there's and also super rare for landscape photography specifically that's where a lot of the collectors seem to hang out and, and buy stuff. So what's interesting is you can, if you have a certain genre of art, you can look at the marketplace and see, you know, the, the history of the sales, who's buying what. And you can see very notably that certain collectors are buying certain types of art. And that's how you find out who the collectors are for your type of work. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, like, too, like, you always want to go where your audience are, and it's not just a matter of like finding like the cheapest like platform or cheapest chain to mint your tokens. Because if you want to mint cheap tokens, like cheap NFTs, I mean, you can do it on like bakery swap. But the problem is, most of the people there are these are like uh, I can say like these are like uh, uh, people who can't really afford a lot, right? If they if these people are paying like two dollar per transaction versus like twenty dollar per transaction those people the two dollar people probably won't be spending like thousands of dollars to buy nft they probably would just spend like twenty dollars for nft so so yeah so knowing your market plays a huge role and, and yeah and then uh and then um i think uh there's also another one uh, i think you know, um aaron just asked a question about um like I think he just made a point about um like Cardano NFT. So, like, do you so maybe for this point for Chris, uh, do you plan to expand over to Cardano or at least be a pioneer, even though um there's no proven market there yet? Um, this is for Chris got uh, for Oh, Cardano. Well, I'll be honest. I don't know um too much about it, but I have learned recently that uh the Cordano might be used widely in Africa as a, a yeah. huge form of, of being able to transfer money between each other. Um, because you, if, if you think about the way the banking system works in Africa, it's very corrupt. 
Um, it's hard to get a bank account. And even if you set up a bank account, um, you don't know where your money is going to be. So um, there are a few initiatives right now with Cordano uh, where they're really trying to push their, their, their blockchain technology to allow people in Africa to transfer money with each other without interacting with the banks. So this could be a huge push uh, and initiative down the future uh, with their particular technology. So that's something to look out for. Yeah, and just to expand on that, that's the deal. Uh, what he's refer what Chris is referring to is the the Ethiopia blockchain deal with the school. But I know I've heard that there's another um, there's another I can't recall exactly which country it is within um, Africa, but there's another one coming down the pipe for Cardano. So um, there, Cardano doesn't have smart contracts right now. It's it's on only on the test net. So um, all the uh, NFTs that are being minted right now are purely without smart contracts. So um, that's quite interesting to see for Cardano, but um, yeah, I, I love Cardano. So that's a, it's a good project in my opinion. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm uh, not gonna show, I'm not not here to show Cardano, but uh, like this is just like looking at my, just my analysis of Cardano, right? If you look at Cardano, it's mostly just speculation, speculative from like, pricing. Like, people are buying because they think it's gonna go up. And I uh, imagine um, if the smart contract does come out and it works, Think about how high the price could go. Um, not financial advice, right? But, uh, this, but this is just something you can keep an eye out for. But I think that the opposite could be true too. If it comes out and it flops, think of how where the price could go. So, um, and yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it really comes down to like uh, you have to do your own homework, right? Uh, I know some people they did uh, they weren't too happy. Like they were like I guess some they were complaining about like oh why is Cardano spending time in Africa, right? Uh, but those people are also biased store. They want to see like stuff happening in North America. Uh, but it comes out to like uh, how they appeal to people. But <laughs> so yeah, they just want to get rich. <laughs> yeah, they just want to get That's rich. <laughs> that is true. They they more like the Lambo board, the Moon board. Right? They don't care about impact. They just want like they just want to, they just go like when Lambo, when Moon. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um probably uh, the next question, uh, maybe the last question, and see as we start wrapping up is uh. For each of your method, um, like how do you see um, like um, a, a bear market may affect um, your method, right? So let's start with Mike. Uh, I guess since you've been around since 2013, um, you can probably tell us about. Uh, yeah, I've seen a I've seen a couple of bear markets. Um, I mean, bear markets they suck. Um, people don't want to typically spend their Bitcoin because it's worth half of what they paid for it. Uh, um, but it usually comes around. I mean, it has every time come around so far. Um, so it's just kind of one of those things you gotta, gotta grin and bear. Um, there's a good video out by Alex Millar. I don't know if you've ever seen it, the Bitcoin crashing video. <laughs> you know, this one time Bitcoin was $200 and it crashed to 13. And then another time it was you know oh. $1,300 and it crashed to 800. Like, it, I, uh, again, it's not financial advice. It could go to zero tomorrow. I don't think it ever will. Um, but bear markets suck, and it just is something we kind of have to deal with. And if we believe in crypto, it'll just continue to go up. And I think it's here to stay. It's been here the last 10 years, and you know, I'm here still after all the bear markets. So, Yeah, and how about uh, Christopher Wong? Uh, do you want to share? Do you think, uh, do you think uh, DeFi yield farming could be affected uh doing a bear market or oh i mean i mean definitely but the, the thing the thing you have to notice is that i i don't you know i wasn't around for the last bull run so someone can correct me if i'm wrong but or the last bear market excuse me um but i don't think DeFi existed like uh, as prominently as it did today um i don't know if anyone has yeah. <laughs> a better answer the last, the the last one was the ico craze yeah. right so yeah, so there there wasn't really DeFi didn't actually exist in the last bear market at least yeah. prominently. So I mean, even during the bear market, it doesn't like you you can still make yield. It, it, like the DeFi doesn't care about whether it's in a bear and a bull market as long as people are swapping. You're making um, fees on your on on the swaps in your pools, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that even if a bear market does happen, as long as you're holding like the blue chip DeFi projects you're not going to have any problems. Um, and that's, that's my personal investment thesis. I'm, I'm going more so for like the long-term projects and I'm very he heavily focused on DeFi. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm definitely, um, 
positive about DeFi and where that's going to go. Because like if you look at the entire uh, like banking system of the world and all the the money that gets printed to the government, it's just DeFi could replace basically all of that. So if you think about the implications and how high DeFi could go just from where we are already, um, it's it's astronomical. So I think that's uh, that the DeFi space has a big uh, uh, growing to do. Like it, it has lots to grow. Are so, you worried that your yields and your staking will go to basically zero during the bear market as activity kind of dies down? Um, on my long, like on my longer term projects, no. Um, on my short-term projects, I would probably um, start to like dollar cost average out of the, like, the short-term ones before, like as as we kind of get um, higher or towards the end of this cycle, right? You don't want to be holding like these low cap shit coins that are like completely useless in the middle of the bear market. I, most of them are probably just going to drop to like zero. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you're holding those blue chips, I mean, the, the yield is still going to be there I, I, and they're not going to die because they've lived through other, the previous bear markets, right? So um, I don't think there's really going to be issues there. Um, I see a question here that's pretty relevant is what is the volatility in a bear market? Um, I mean, apparently from the last ones, I, the last one I saw, like some, some coins literally went to zero. A lot of them went down 99%. It's certainly possible. Um, so yeah. it... Yeah, crypto is mean, very think, volatile. Yeah, um, like, very risky. Um, yeah. yeah, just by looking at charts, I know that um, yeah, most coins um, they most altcoins um, they do go down by like even like over ninety percent, like sometimes one hundred percent. A big project or the project where uh, the team members um, they got their payout already. Right? They did the ICO, they made the money. They don't have that much have that much incentive to keep growing the project. Right when they see that everything's going down the toilet, um. They feel that oh the whole industry is in the bear market. They have no intention to continue. So what you get is you get something called like a soft rug, where the developers just disappear. They don't update on Twitter. Right? You don't see any updates. Right? If they're polite, they'll say, oh, we're moving on. Right? But most of the time, they just go silent. Um, sometimes you may be lucky, right? Where uh, the project you uh the project that uh that look may look like uh, may have stopped but was called Ave. Um, I know some people they were lucky enough they got um before Ave, it was called Ave, it was called Eflen. So I, I know some people they were holding on to that they were about to give up on it when they were updating but but they lucked out <laughs> but yeah but yeah at the end of the day I think I'm mean, like they say that I'm ninety percent of projects ninety five percent of projects will go to zero like if you look at like a lot of projects from the 2017 ICO, right? They're not around today. And if they are around today, uh, they either had like deep pockets right, to continue development over the course of uh, the four year bear market or uh, or they had, they were just very like a diligent, right? They were willing to like fulfill like the promises of um, that they made to people, but most people like would not continue on because eventually uh, you will run out of money. You're gonna have to close the doors. Uh, yeah. So, and then, uh, yeah. So, uh, for uh, and then um, the same question, uh, for the market, uh, Chris Kalka, do you want to do you want to share share anything about the uh, NFTs and like within the bear market? Well, you know, the, I mean, I, I'm really new at this, but I. What I've learned, at least what I believe, is that we're really in a whole new realm of, of transacting uh, money, property, and items. In, in it won't be long before we can buy a home uh, by clicking a button. And the ownership will be transferred from one person to another. We won't have to use lawyers. We won't have to use the banks. All those middle people will be negligible. And I think that's why we see a huge push from the banks and government and a lot of, of places saying, hey, we don't want crypto. The thing is, it's going to erase their jobs. Uh, but I believe that's the future. And we are definitely trending in that direction. I don't think crypto is going to go anywhere. I don't think Bitcoin ETH um, is a bad bet to put in in the long run, personally. Obviously, you don't want to put your money in that you're not willing to lose. but um, you know, you can lose money through real estate. Um, there could be a market crash. You can lose everything uh, if you buy at the peak and then all of a sudden everything goes down. So there's volatility in absolutely everything you do. But with the blockchain technology, 
Uh, and with crypto behind that, I think there is a future that is just, you know, when you think about 30 years ago, what did we think about the internet? We had no idea what the internet is. We couldn't even describe it. We couldn't even understand it. And I think blockchain, crypto is that future where in 30 years, we're going to be, it's going to be something so unique and different. But I think there's huge um, provisions behind that technology and getting out of this whole, you know, printing money, the banks control, the lawyers and everything in between and allowing us to transfer property from one person to another uh, without every middle person, middleman, but middle person now since I have to be, um, you know, uh, both women and men. But uh, yeah, I believe that's, that is truly the future. So there's a, a big future in all these uh, crypto technologies uh, and altcoins. And maybe we don't know specifically which each one will, are, is gonna do well, but it's still worth diversifying and, uh, and keeping tabs on, absolutely. Mute. I keep always moving myself. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to see if we have any final questions. Uh, if not, uh, we, I'm going to move on to uh, closing statements from each one of you guys. Um, so just scrolling it here. I see there's a question in the chat, or uh, not a question, but just something that I want to point out is um, <laughs> uh, someone said institutional adoption uh, to crypto is bad news. It, is ju it just means crypto is centralized in fewer hands. So maybe that's something that we should take around the table here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe we can we can look into that. Um, centralization versus, or even just institutional adoption. Uh, um, like, what does it mean for like each of your space? So, uh, so maybe we start with Mike. Uh, do you have anything? Yeah. Right, so, institutional adoption. That that's the Lambo Bros. <laughs> they want money. They want fiat. They want to increase their fiat. Um, it, it kind of sucks when they buy a bunch of crypto, I think, because yeah. it's a bit less for everybody else. They pump our bags a bit. Um, but I think there's going to be a lot of institutional guys that right now are kind of being put on pedestals like, oh, my God, like these guys are buying crypto. It's so amazing. And then they're going to pull out. They're going to rug pull Bitcoin. They're going to rug pull ETH. And, you know, it's going to crash the market when somebody moves you know, 100 million, 200 million worth of Bitcoin in a couple minutes, right? Like, and they, I mean, corporations, they need to make money. That's that's their their goal. So they're not going to hesitate to piss off a couple Bitcoiners because they want to make, you know, their 20x return. So it might take a few years for that to happen, but I think we're going to ha have a point in time where we're going to be fighting against corporations who are rug pulling us. Yeah, you know, corporations and maybe even countries. Yeah, maybe even countries. I mean, like, uh, I think there's, I think there's an argument for both, right? Like, um, I think the point that you've made in terms of like crypto being centralized in fewer hands, yes. I mean, it, 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 that's just the nature of having more money. If you have a billions of dollars when you buy the asset, you're you're holding more of that asset than, for example, everyone in this room right combined is obviously is probably holding less than for example microstrategy who has like 1 billion plus worth of bitcoin um having said that when you see when a bit for example when one bank buys crypto or when an institution buys crypto then everyone else starts to question why um people are buying it right and then they start to buy it right so then you start to kind of disperse all of the bitcoin and all of the other all the other all of the other coins and it also signals like more adoption right so as the institutional adoption ramps up, that means more people are, are simply just buying and in, in believing in cryptocurrency. Could they dump their coins all at the same time? Sure, they could. I mean, that's, that's basically what happened on the last um, dump here, right? There was coordinated dumping and FUD all at the same time. Like it's clear as day. You can see it on the on-chain metrics. If you look at any of the outflows, the inflows, you can see it all happening on, the, on, uh, on those on-chain metrics. So um, there's, I think it's positive and negative in, in, in both regards. I personally, I think it's a little more positive in my opinion, but. Yeah, in the short term, uh, we, do, we do need that uh, validation uh, for sure. The yeah, number go up, but can only go up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
till they go down. <laughs> oh, 100%. Doesn't always go up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they buy mostly on OTC or over the counter. So it's not going to affect it. Right. I mean, imagine if uh, Michael Saylor takes his 500 million and buys it right on the spot market. That's going to be a huge movement. But Yeah, but what about when that guy dumps? That guy will dump someday. And everybody's going to, I don't know. Everybody's like, oh, he's such a great guy, but he's going to dump. One day he'll dump. dump. For sure. Um, he'll become the, the, the Bitcoin evil everybody <laughs> hates. I mean, at the end of the day, he has his uh, his uh, shareholders he's responsible to, right? And uh, he's, he's, he needs to make profit for them. So, I mean, yeah, I think he just like keeping an eye on what he's doing could be a good indicator, right? If you see that um, he's moving his tokens out, because uh, he is a publicly traded company, right? MicroStrategy and uh, MicroStrategy. So uh, he has to disclose that he's yeah. going to dump. So if you see that he's moving, right, he's about to dump, uh, you should make a plan, right? Just, you should decide, like, do you want to dump along with him or do you want to uh, have that, like short the market instead? Though shorting is the whole different thing. So, yeah. So, and then, um, yeah. I think um I think um, that's almost everything we have um, for the main uh main panel side of it for uh the non trading methods um we I'm still gonna open up uh, the floor uh keep the evening rest of the evening open for um, other discussions and I know some people here they do enjoy trading and speculation and talking about like conspiracy theories about <laughs> like who's manipulating the market and I think this is what um yeah this is what our community is for uh, the after hours where we can talk about this and. Yeah, and expand our knowledge in the space. So once again, I do want to thank um, each of you panelists for sharing each of your methods. And I do wish all, you guys are the best in your ways to grow. And I do hope um, everyone here who joins today uh, felt inspired about the different ways of growing and how that how um, this, uh, like trading isn't just the only way to grow your crypto. And maybe in two weeks, um, I may try to get like a couple more people. Like maybe I may get like someone who is making crypto through, like say gaming. That's a good, there's something interesting to see. Like, can you make crypto by gaming? Um, that uh, that would be with Andrew, um, the guy who, I think he was, he was the one who got uh, the, the Bitcoin ATM at Waves Coffee. And then maybe someone now got someone who's like maybe working for like a crypto company. Like, so someone who's getting paid in like Bitcoin salary. Maybe that could be you again, Chris. If that per lap gets back to you, you can share it experience. Oh uh, yeah, I, I did that application like, I don't know, it's probably like two months ago. I, I'm probably gonna do a couple more from, yeah. from there. It would just be cool to like get close to, um, yeah. like even if I'm not working directly with the blockchain, it would be pretty cool to just, you know, be in that space and you could be all around all these NFTs and whatnot. So I think it'd be pretty interesting. Um, I love talking about crypto, so I could do it all day. <laughs> But you, you know what would be a very nice way to uh, to actually talk about, I guess, be in crypto and also get paid? Um, if you run for office. If you run for <laughs> office and run as a crypto candidate, right? I believe um, if you are if you are a member of parliament, MP, right, or even just an MLA, right, uh, you get paid by the tax dollars. And I'm pretty sure we have a lot of crypto fans here like, who will be willing to support one of their own. <laughs> You're trying to make me run for like mayor or something. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll vote with you. I'm, I, I vote with you. I'm, I'm sure. Okay, like, uh, prime minister. Oh, uh, yeah. Prime minister. Prime minister yeah. uh, Wong. Nice. Yeah. I mean, just 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 don't do what uh, McAfee did. I mean, he was he tried to run for president. Oh. And the conspiracies. So like, I haven't <laughs> gone down that rabbit hole yet, but like, I I, I heard there's a like a thread on Reddit, and it, it goes down real deep down the rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I need to find that so I could read it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but yeah, I'm just gonna wrap up uh, the live stream and everything, and, everything, uh, and we're gonna open up the, I guess, after hours. But uh, once again, uh, thanks for watching us. Um, if you are watching us from YouTube, uh, remember to just smash that like button, hit subscribe, and take the little bell 